I am really pleased to introduce David Gadsden from our conservation team and Ryan Perkle from our geo design team. And they are gonna have a chat with Ray and tell us a little bit about who they are and how their work combines Esri tools with the people who work in conservation. Hi, David. Thank you, Nick. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. Uh, my role at Esri is to support the global conservation community and help work across all the business units at Esri that are, are really making a difference and contributing tools and, and training to, to that uh, group. Um, I'm, we're joined today by the extraordinary Ray Wynn Grant, who you've all had an opportunity to, to get to know both this year and from last year's user conference, uh, as well as my colleague, Ryan Perkle. And uh, Ryan, why don't you tell us a little bit about your role at Esri? Well, thanks, David, and great to see you again, right? Nice this to is see awesome you. To be here with you. Great. So, Nick, I think nailed it, right? I have one of the best jobs at Esri, and that I get to work every day with helping our clients engage in their real-world GIS work. So, I'm really excited. I'm going to be talking about one of those such projects today. Perfect. So, today's topic is community conservation. Uh, as you all know, the world is facing incredible challenges. Uh, the human population now approaching nearly 8 billion has led to dramatic changes uh, across the Earth's surface, and there is simply very little space left for nature. Um, that has led to a number of exemplary initiatives to set aside more land, both 30 by 30 and half Earth and many others. But the key, as we all know, is to do these projects sustainably and to get buy-in from the communities so that they have a la lasting effect. So we're here to talk with Ryan and Ray and, and share their insights and experiences on that topic. So Ray, let's, let's kick it off. Can you share your experiences and vision of how communities matter in conservation? Yeah, absolutely. And I kind of don't know where to begin because so much of my work, albeit it's with wildlife, is with understanding how wildlife need and use landscapes that are shared with communities, human communities. And so the idea is essentially to create harmony, to create coexistence and balance um, and really positive futures between both humans and wildlife. But I have found, and I, I really feel like I learned it the hard way, so it wasn't necessarily taught in all the classrooms I was in, but I found through a lot of my work that starting with the human needs, starting with community needs, really broadening the idea of what community is, um, is the right first step. You know, really identifying what are the challenges in human communities, even beyond, you know, natural resources, but moving to economics, moving to, you know, health, et cetera, is the best place to start to create a sustainable conservation plan. Um, and I've also been really fortunate that GIS has been a part of my work from the beginning as well. So the first day I started learning about wildlife was the first day that I was embedded in a you know, local indigenous community in need. And it was also the first day that I opened you know, a desktop arc map application. I like, mean it quite literally, these all happened at the same time. <laughs> so my career has grown in this very beautiful way. Um, and it's also been very focused on you know, giving, creating ways, you know, using science to create ways to give to communities, to aid them, to empower them, and may help them shape the futures that they're looking for. Ryan, you're our lead for our support for 30 by 30 initiatives. How does community conservation play into your work? So I think arguably some of the best examples of community conservation are the 3030 initiatives mm -hmm. that are springing up across the globe, mm -hmm. the U.S., and of course, most recently here in California. Yeah. So Last time I checked, I think it's something like 80 countries and really high profile organizations like the High Ambition Coalition, the United Nations, mm -hmm. the G8, when they mm -hmm. met a couple, uh, a couple months ago. So it really truly is a global movement. Mm -hmm. I think a little bit closer to home, and as Secretary Crowfoot outlined in the plenary really earlier today, 3030 efforts are really about establishing that ambitious conservation goal but it will ultimately be reliant on the communities mm -hmm. charting the exact path of how to implement that locally. Mm -hmm. And that's a really exciting thing. So I think, put another way, really think of 3030 as being a galvanizing conservation movement, but it's not directive in dictating which lands or waters will be protected. Mm -hmm. That part is really left up to the communities mm -hmm. um, to determine what's best for them. Mm -hmm. Right. So the question then for the GIS community, I think, is really then how can we help empower those communities with 
the information, the tools they need to help them in charting those paths forward. And really one of the answers is GIS. That's mm -hmm. what this mm -hmm. software is ultimately built for. Mm -hmm. And we're exactly working on things like that with the state of California to help yeah. them advance their 3030 work. We're helping the state to bring together the best available data so that that can be provided out to communities. We're helping the state to develop the maps and the apps to communicate these data in new and novel ways to help communities make sense of it mm -hmm. so they can actually implement these conservation blueprints. And then when aggregated together, the sum of the parts will help us achieve our 3030 goal. So really, it's really one of these interesting things. If we're to protect 30%, it's really important for us to understand where we are mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. right? And so I think this is where the audience comes in. Yes. We have a quiz question for you. So this question, approximately how much of California is currently protected for biodiversity as of today? Is it 0%, 22%, 29%, 46%, or something else that I guess we haven't added maybe? throw in a, uh, another option. So we'll take a moment, please take a moment to respond to that quiz question and we'll come back to those results um, in a little bit. Perfect, yeah, thank you, Ryan. Uh, when we talk about communities, Ray, I mean, we're, we're really kind of trying to be very inclusive. Mm -hmm. How do you um, build trust? How do you engage um, everyone in the process? Mm -hmm. um, tr you know, especially historically excluded communities that might feel disenfranchised from traditional program approaches? Yeah, absolutely. It's such a good question, and I really hope it's a question that we are all constantly asking ourselves and our institutions and the people that we work with and even the communities that we're working with. Because I've learned that community can mean something different to different people at different times in different places and in different situations. Um, and, you know, there are a number of different groups that have been historically excluded from leadership, from decision making, especially from conservation, you know, et cetera. And it's a really good practice, I believe, to really do our best to challenge ourselves to broaden our definition of communities. Um, and there's a really wonderful scholar named Cynthia Malone, and she and I went on a journey years ago um, towards uh, kind of disentangling, you know, uh, those excluded groups. And figuring out who is invisible in our communities, you know, especially in the conservation context. So who are the invisible members? And different people that we polled had different answers. You know, some people said, you know, well, you know, preschoolers are excluded. I think preschoolers are really important community members. We were just talking about how our young children interact with the environment way more than we do, you know, and they probably have some good ideas and they have a certain set of needs. You know, often elderly folks are excluded from a lot of these conversations, you know, um, and a lot of folks in between. One of the beautiful things about GIS technology is that it's able to reach different members of communities and engage them in discussions, especially regarding conservation, 30 by 30 goals, et cetera. You know, we can get kids to use, you know, this information. We can get elderly people to contribute. We can get people with varying physical abilities, you know, to be active, very, very active in pushing forward our knowledge, our understanding, and our science. It's really, really tremendous. And at the same time, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to reach those historically um, you know, under-empowered groups. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure that we have the proper voices who are leading, and I truly mean at the forefront of leading you know, conservation. So it's, you know, I think GIS gives us a lot of opportunity and we just have to make sure that everyone has what they need to use it. So I've learned so much about community conservation in the past two years as mm -hmm. part of a Esri Press project that we've been supporting uh, the Jane Goodall and the Jane Goodall Institute to, to really summarize and, and define their approach to community-led conservation. So uh, in, the, in the coming year, we'll be releasing uh, local voices, local choices, mm -hmm. uh, the Takari approach to community-led conservation. And what's fascinating about this book is that truly inclusive uh, voices coming together to talk about this program that evolved over several decades. 
Um, so it's not only uh, sort of Jane's team and Jane herself, but the Tanzanians that actually were side by side with Jane and working in the communities. And, and her approach, as I think many of us are, are aware of, was to go in and listen. Well, the goal was conservation. But in order to achieve that conservation, that very challenging environment where livelihoods were struggling, uh, it, it would not have been effective to go in and lead with chimpanzees and habitat, right? It was really listening to the community, working with them to, to find strategies to support their well-being, and from that, uh, conservation evolved from it, or conservation outcomes. Um, for our part at Esri, we're building a set of apps to help uh, streamline that community-led conservation activity. Um, and that involves understanding stakeholders, understanding assets around you, being able to share and and uh, develop uh, programs around, again, locally and um, sort of uh, organically led endeavors to, to make a difference. Uh, Ryan, you've been working on a series of apps as well to support the 30 by 30 work. Can you tell us a bit about those? Yeah, so related to those tools and applications we're helping California build, it's really about taking this tiered approach to mm -hmm. engage um, citizens and stakeholders at all levels of, of the process. Um, and really the tiered approach that we're taking first starts with storytelling. Yeah. And it's the concepts, the process, the underlying information that the average Californian, for example, needs to know if mm -hmm. we're all to target this mm -hmm. vision um, mm -hmm. together. So storytelling, what kind of apps do you think we're using for that? Story maps. Story maps, there we are. <laughs> My okay, favorite. Awesome. <laughs> so the, the second tier then of apps is really about data exploration. And these go far beyond these data viewers where we're toggling on dozens and dozens of layers. These are really about extracting data in terms of new patterns, mm -hmm. relationships, and visualizing it in new ways so that we can get more out of our science. Mm -hmm. And that really helps us to identify portions of the landscape that will start to comprise conservation opportunities. The final tier is really about helping communities synthesize their work mm -hmm. through true decision support tools. Yeah. And those are based in terms of uh, developing scenarios and plans, alternatives to allow folks to get their hands dirty in the process mm -hmm. and look at what different pieces of the conservation blueprint might look like for them. So all of these things together are what we're doing to help the state empower citizens in their communities to be able to engage um, uh, in this process, really. So I think we've got the quiz yes, answer. Yes, the quiz, back. yes. Let's take a check back at that and um, see where we are. So the correct answer was about 22% which means we've got about 8% or 8 million acres to go in the state of California to hit this objective. Now, folks at the state are actually working with the conservation community to determine exactly what that threshold is. But if we take that 8 million acres, for example, as uh, the starting point, this is really showing us how far we have to go to hit this target, mm -hmm. right? So the question then becomes, which 8 million acres? And I can't think of a better problem for GIS to help solve. For sure. Perfect. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Um, as you can see, 30 by 30 in these initiatives of engaging communities is important for all of us to lean into. We're not only talking about creating new protected areas, but rather how do we negotiate outcomes that we can all live with going forward?